was back in the 80s. And to be perfectly honest, I did not know what engineering was. Um, this would be my mother's reaction to, to what I tell people you do, because nobody in my family knew what engineering was. And, and essentially, um, uh, I went to, um, I went to a, 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 an open day talk in the university in UCC, and I knew I was interested in science and maths, and then somebody started to talk about engineering. And I suddenly realized that that is what I wanted in terms of you know, technology or in terms of, uh, of technical things. And it was only then that, uh, that I kind of realized it, and nobody that I knew was an engineer at the time, and that's why I decided to go off and do engineering. So it's a kind of funny thing for me, and, and I think this is trying to summarize my experience as an undergrad engineer and um, the time I spent. So I, I ended up doing um, an undergrad degree and a master's and a PhD. And I kind of felt all of the time that I'd picked the right thing, but it wasn't quite right. And I, I, I couldn't, I, I, to be perfectly honest, at the time I didn't have the vocabulary or the understanding to explain why that was the case. Um, and it seems funny that I'm kind of still in engineering years and years later, but I felt like that all of my time, and certainly as an undergraduate. And I'm the kind of, um, what I say, I'm kind of a, a, a very tenacious person. And because I was a tenacious person, and I don't know whether you, you know, I started so I would finish. And it was kind of like that. So I went through the undergraduate degree, and then I actually, I, I, if I had to describe myself as an undergraduate, I was the exact middle point in the class, kind of averagely in the middle. And um, I left. Um, and went out into, a, um, as some people call the real world, for a year, but knew really that academia was what I wanted, and I came back and did a master's and, 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 and PhD. And all of the time, I knew that I really wanted to be in academia. I knew that there was something amazing there, but I also felt, oh, I'm not really sure. There's something not quite right. So that kind of continued um, on for a while. And when I finally um, graduated as a PhD, and I, I, I don't know whether you know, this is a very cork joke, help, help, my daughter, the doctor is drowning. I had very, very, very proud parents, and I, I was very, very happy to be at that point. And I did know that, you know, the academic world is a fantastically privileged world to be in, and one that allows you great freedom and, and great you know, uh, potential to think things and do things that you kind of, outside, you didn't have any kind of restrictions on you, and I wanted that. And very luckily, at that stage, I started, it was, it was very different to now, and when I'm on, I'm on a lot of interview committees now, and I look and I think, oh my God, how does anyone get a job now? They're so, so, such high barriers, but at the time, I started lecturing before I'd finished my PhD. So when I got to the end of that, and this, this is relevant in this particular point, um, a, a job came up in the department where I could kind of convert from the PhD into a permanent job. And uh, these are the famous last words of one of my friends. He said, look, if you don't get this job, you'll be the first person ever who's in the job already, who goes for an interview and then doesn't get the job. And of course, this is what happened. <laughs> I, I absolutely didn't get the job. And um, it was really, at that time, I was very passionate about teaching. I was very passionate about wanting to be an academia, um, and I, I really hadn't kind of, I suppose I hadn't really found myself, and a very, very good person got the job instead of me, and, and I, you know, I, 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 I remember one friend of mine saying, are you going to cry all weekend? And I said, yes, but that only lasted for a while, and I, I very luckily, a, a, another opening came up soon, and, and, and that uh, got me started in academia fully. And what it did for me, I suppose, um, I suppose I started from a shaky ground where I felt I'd kind of just sneaked in and, um, you know, that I was lucky to be there at all. And I suppose there was a lot of times where you feel, okay, I'm lucky to be here, so who am I and what have I got to offer and what am I about? And I, and I suppose that those other feelings of mm, what's not quite right, they were kind of all coming together in that context. So, so for me, there was kind of two parallel things going on at the same time. So I was at telecoms, I was working in the area of telecoms, and I had done a master's in, so it was back in the day when mobile phones actually were only in cars. There's probably a lot of people here who don't remember that. And I did antenna design stuff, and then um, the exciting topic of my PhD was radio propagation in Dublin City, you know, at two gigahertz or something like that. So I, I'd been in that area, um, and, and, and I think a number of things became really clear to me, and, and the kind of two things that were happening. So the first thing was around, you know, this notion of kind of being narrow or wide in the academic space. And, and 
I think there's a lot of fantastic academics I work with, and they're really brilliant because they dig deep. They're in a subject that's a really, really narrow subject. They know everything about that subject, and they're utterly fantastic. And I work with people like that, and you're absolutely sure that whatever question they're going to be asked, they're going to know it, and they're going to be like world class in it. And I was never, never able to kind of go into that deep and narrow thing. And I found myself increasingly kind of wanting to look at more and more and more topics. And in fact, uh, um, uh, actually, Jane, well, you, you know, a friend of mine, John O'Hagan, when I was trying to get promoted at one stage, told me, look, when you're trying to get promoted, don't write all those things that you're interested in on a CV. You'll never, ever get promoted because you can't be good at all those things. You can only be good at one thing. And in fact, he was right about the promotion thing. I just dumped things off a CV. But nonetheless, I think it's a kind of prevailing attitude uh, in, in, in academia, and it was one that didn't particularly suit me. And um, I suppose I link this to, and Mary, I have a picture of cats for you in this I link this to the fact that one of my great skills, and this might sound like a ridiculous thing to say, is I am very good at herding cats. And this is no insult to all the people who work with me here who are sitting in this, in this room. But the thing is, is that I like really big ideas. I like big, complicated ideas. And when you work in academia, it's not like working in a company where you have the bottom line to drive how people are going, so we have to make X profit or our pay. It's much more about getting lots of disparate people kind of coming together and accepting that that's going to be kind of, uh, you know, not working kind of in a kind of logical, straightforward way. So, so that was the first thing that was happening, this no notion of kind of um, everything, uh, you know, the, being too narrow and wanting to go broader in this kind of bigger picture interest and kind of, I suppose, you know, uh, interested in people and how people work together was, was very dominant. And, and, and the second thing that kind of happened was this, the, the, this feeling, I suppose, always I've had of there being something missing. And what was it about engineering? And I mean, if I look at myself, I mean, for somebody who works in kind of cutting edge technology and with people who understand it so deeply, in my house, like I, I would have, I couldn't live without Wi Fi, but at one stage, I didn't have a TV, I didn't have any, any other gadgets in the house. So it, there, there was always something, I had always a strange relationship with technology. So, so, so I suppose, I was always looking for engineering plus something. And when I look around now, I think there are so many amazing, amazing opportunities to think about engineering in a wider context. But at that time, um, I kind of didn't, uh, didn't see those. And, um, initially. But one of the really, really good things, and this sounds like a, a, a terrible thing to say, I actually was in a department where people didn't really care what I did. And, Actually, that for me was a hugely enabling thing. So some people might say, okay, I don't care what you do, and I, I find that really difficult because I'm not getting the support. Whereas I thought, they don't care what I do. I can do anything I want to do. And I found it hugely enabling because of that. So I started to kind of look around. And it started, I suppose, mainly in an engineering context. So rather than just be interested in, in pure telecommunications or wireless communications, I, I really got into the kind of wider view of, um, I suppose, and this sounds, I suppose, kind of bravado or, or arrogant in one way, I, I, I have a huge interest in how, how can we change the world. So I was very motivated by um, technology and how technology um, empowers some people, disempowers other people. And from that perspective, I began looking within my own area of wireless communications in the context of you know the policy and the economics around who owns radio waves, why do those people own them only, how can other people own them, how can things be shared, how can we enable new places Players in a space that didn't exist, those kind of questions. And that certainly was a fantastic relief for me to be able to kind of take the technology and kind of understand how the technology mattered rather than just looking at the technology itself. But it kind of it kind of didn't stop there, and I, I I started with a picture of a chair, and here's here's my next picture of a chair, and uh, this I suppose Mari mentioned it earlier. I began to meet other people who were doing other things. So Mari, uh, back from the 80s, Mari, and even earlier I think Mari was involved in digital media and very futuristic things about it. And then uh, the, the the person that introduced us, who Mari met, she came to Dublin in the context of Media Lab Europe. So do do anybody here remember Media? 
Media Lab Europe, so it was MIT Media Lab, was in, uh, it, it, it actually opened a branch in Dublin. And in the greater scheme of things, it kind of was a disaster, and in, in, in the funding model didn't survive, and it ended up closing down. But from my own personal experience, I saw people who were mixing um, you know, arts, humanities, technology, um, creativity together in a different way, and it certainly was a huge opportunity um, for me to kind of go, oh, there's a whole load of different ways of doing things. Then there were people like Mari with her courses, and there were people in my own department in music and media technologies was springing up, and you kind of thought, yes, you don't have to be an engineer in one particular way. There's potential to be an engineer in kind of many different ways. And... Um, especially because I was interested in networks. I mean, everything I look at is a network or a network of people here. And that network perspective, I think, is a kind of powerful perspective to bring kind of to the wider space. So um, I, I, there, you know, I was talking to this woman very much at the beginning, and you were mentioning that you've been to all of these series, and there's kind of, you know, is there something that triggers people thinking? And there wasn't any one thing. There were a lot of influences. But the reason I put these chairs up is uh, this is just one example where, so these are uh, Ray and Charles Eames, Eames chairs for people who would recognize that. And I, I was hugely struck by this um, video, that, or sorry, film that they made. So they made this film in 1953, and it was called A Communications Prime. And, and Ray and Charles Eames decided that um, it was really important that architects and artists knew more about communications and telecommunications. And what they did is, um, in, the, in the end of the 40s, there's a very, very famous um, engineer called Claude Shannon. And Claude Shannon um, was kind of the, the father of information theory. And, and, and basically everything that we know in the, the digital world and what we understand today kind of emanates somehow from, from this point. And as an artist, so uh, Ray was an artist, she was an artist, and, and Charles was an architect. And they brought a fearlessness to kind of trying to understand technology at the time. And if anyone gets a chance, a communications primer is easily available online. It's very old-fashioned in one way. It has this really old Elmer Bernstein music. And, um, but what I loved about it is that I could look at it today, and I could reinterpret it into the cutting-edge technology that I understood. So, so for, for engineers who were here, things like I could see MIMO in it, you could see cognitive radio in it, you could see all these things. And I thought to myself, you know, the reason, there were two, two things going on there. There was kind of a group of artists who were kind of fearless about their engaging with the technology. They weren't held back by the fact they weren't information theorists or they didn't understand something completely. But at the same time, they had a broader interpretation. And, and this is what I was kind of really interested in, this notion of kind of ambiguity, this kind of wider ambiguity they brought to things, which was kind of a positive ambiguity, and an ambiguity that allowed for interpretation and kind of reinterpretation. And I think I began to feel over time that this is the kind of thing that, you know, when I was saying something was missing, and I wasn't sure where it sat, that, yes, engineering is wonderful, and there's so many fantastic things, um, but... Uh, I suppose what I, I, I kind of believe in, there's kind of no such thing as absolute truth. Everything sits in a cultural, social, and uh, economic context, and that engineering needs to be interpreted more and more in those kind of contexts. And it might be very, very obvious to many people here who come from a multidisciplinary background, but it became more and more obvious to me that it's for these reasons that I wanted uh, to be involved beyond just kind of plain engineering and, uh, and to include this mix. So. I'm going to move on to one more uh, seat or, or chair. Um, this is outside the Science Gallery as well. It's called the Camden Bench. Have people seen it? It's around the corner. Um, so, so this kind of summarizes some of the stuff I was just talking about there. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, the Camden Bench uh, was designed in Camden, in London. And it was designed because they kind of wanted to stop what they considered unsociable behavior. And there is, um, there's a book actually called Unpleasant Design that deals with this and many other things like this. And so it's, it's specially designed so you can't sleep on it, so we won't have any homeless people sleeping on it. You can't do graffiti on it because it's a special paint on it. Apparently, and I, I don't get this completely, you can't do drugs on it because <laughs> they say things like, there's no crevices in it to hide your drugs. I didn't think that was such a good selling point 
point of it. You know, um, you could, you, you're, you're supposed to sit in it. You kind of probably don't sit in it for that long. You can't skateboard on it because of the shape of it and things like that. And, and what's really, really interesting about this for me is that the architecture, the rules are embedded in the architecture. So when you take this device or this seat or this, the, the, this bench, you don't actually need to make a rule. You don't need to say um, homeless people can't sleep on this. You don't need to say, um, you know, you can't ram it with the truck either, by the way. You, you, you don't need to say you can't do graffiti on it. It's just embedded in the architecture. So the architecture is the dominant feature that allows uh, the rules to exist. And you might disagree or agree that it's unfair or not unfair that homeless people should be able to sleep on benches, but you've no choice. The architecture does all the work. There's, there's, no, there's no ability. And why I put this here is because it's very, very visible and very solid, and you can see it. And I come from a very invisible world, so I come from the world of wireless communications. And in the world of wireless communications, and where you put sensors and, and you look at things like the Internet of Things, um, and we look to the future in, in a lot what we do in my research group, where we think, OK, what will the Internet of Things look over the next five and ten years when you embed the whole world with sensors, you measure data from around, um, and you use that data uh, to make decisions and to actuate things in the real world. That's much more invisible, but we're actually doing the same thing as we're doing with the Camden bench. You're architecting into the world around you laws and rules, but they're just much more invisible. And while you can see it in the bench, it's harder for people to see it when they look at technology. And this, I suppose, motivates me hugely and is the second you know, kind of way why I wanted engineering plus, because I think you can't just engineer without thinking of these things. And I, I'll give you just some very simple examples. Uh, I mean, I've used this example a lot, so, so some of the people who work with me may be sick of it, but, um, and, um, and it's the example of that, you know, I, I use it all the time because people can get it immediately. I went to a talk where somebody was demonstrating a smart shopping mall, because that's absolutely what we need in this world, or you, men, you know, it measures what people come in and out of the, whether they're male or female, where they're loitering, where their gaze is, um, you know, so that you can help sell more, or you can do directed advertising. So uh, this, this very happy, lovely engineer was demonstrating his kit and really, really proud. And he got a man and woman to come up from the audience. And uh, he showed that when the man stood in front of this kit, uh, it recognized he was a man. And the advert said, uh, you know, an adventure sports magazine. And when the woman stood in front of it, and you're going to know the end of this question, the, the sentence, when the woman stood in front of the interactive piece, of course, a homemaker magazine came up. But what was interesting about the event was not that that was the demo. What was interesting is that he was genuinely totally oblivious. He was really, really happy that his product was engineered really, really well. He was really, really happy that the product worked really well, that it was completely responsive, that it didn't mix up male or female. Um, and, and, and he had no complete, like, he hadn't any big plan. But when I saw it, what I saw is that you were actually architecting patriarchal laws into the environment around you. And not alone were you doing that, we were doing that in a way in which we were sleepwalking into it. So that because it's kind of so benign and so slow and, and, and all-encompassing, and because we can't see it, um, you know, that's what's happening. So that kind of stuff really, really motivated me and kind of really draws me to the statement I make a lot, that there is no such thing as neutral design. You know, that it doesn't matter whether it's a circuit, and it doesn't matter whether it's an algorithm, and it doesn't matter, you know, whether it's a network. Um, there is a kind of political objective function, as we'd say in engineering. You optimize something around an objective function, and that objective function is set up by somebody. It might be a fantastic objective function. It might be to maximize the amount of money we get from this, or to maximize the number of people who are allowed to view this you know, uh, video, it could be any of those things. But, but these things are happening around us. And, and for me, um, I, I've become more and more aware over time that it was very, very important to take this engineering plus view. And more and more, as I met people like Mary and as I met people like Lynn and other people in the science gallery and people over the years, more and more for me, um, it was an arts and an arts practice mindset brought to bear on these kind of issues that were the things that kind of unlocked things. And it, I, I don't know whether, you know, what backgrounds people are from here, but for me, as I began working with artists more and more, 
you know, they have this kind of natural tendency to question power. Um, there's kind of a natural kind of feminist kind of approach under underpinning a lot of a, a lot of the way the way uh, artists think, and that was kind of I suddenly felt now I've sorted what's missing. And, and some people, when you talk about engineering and you suddenly talk about art, they assume you automatically mean, you know, arts and technology. You mean, for example, uh, interactive installations, or you might mean drama or theatre or something with extra technology. I love all that too, but that's not what I mean. I mean, it's about the kind of creative arts practices, the crap from earlier, the creative arts practices that, you know, allow you to, to look at the world around you and kind of experience that world in a different way and basically allow you to, to, to change the world. So I think you can only change the world if you understand these kind of things. So, so that tendency for me, you know, to, to kind of say, okay, I can't be narrow. You know, I'd love to be as brilliant as a lot of the academics I know who can really dive into a subject. I want that kind of bigger picture and this need for more. Those two things then eventually they kind of began to work together. And, and, and I just want to explain then how, how they began to work together. So I think we're kind of in a very interesting time uh, in research that for some people is, is complex because the lone scholar idea has kind of, it, is challenging. It's a fantastic thing to support lone scholars. Um, but there is a huge kind of movement in the world as well where people are looking at large-scale collaborations. And, and my mindset and my capabilities are just very suited to that. So I was in completely, I suppose, the right place to be able to take advantage of where you see this going. So one of the things that came out of the last number of years, so um, uh, I just put in the latest thing I'm involved in, but... I got the opportunity and the very privileged opportunity to run very large scale research centres. So I initially ran a centre called CTVR, it was a name that uh, no one could ever remember, the Centre for Telecommunications Value Chain Research, trips off the lip, I'm obviously great with names, um, and we went for the, the, the more simple Connect, <laughs> so that everyone might understand, and it's a, a centre for future networks and communications. So it's a, a really large scale centre and it's spread all over Ireland and I, some of my colleagues, my fantastic colleagues are there and one of the things I've found about it is um, my herding cat skills are used perfectly in this context because going back to what I said earlier, a research institute or a research centre is not like a company. We have a whole load of things we have to achieve. We have to do excellent research. We have to engage with industry. We have to bring in lots of money. We have to uh, do education and outreach. We have to do training. But you have to get everyone to do it in a kind of goodwill way. You know, you, you really only have a carrot, you never have a stick. Um, and, and essentially, I think the mindset about that comes from, it's not just engineering, it's engineering plus allows you to think in that way. So when I look right across the centre, I think it becomes easier then for me to realise that, you know, uh, different skills will play different roles and kind of bring people together. So that's, that, that, that's been a very, very um, fruitful part, this, uh, you know, to be able to kind of operate on that scale and to be able to think about big projects and we look across, I just we use this slide to show that we look across all sorts of different networks and I just added this one example so, so and it's a kind of example that, 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 that I just put in as one project before I go back to the, the, the art and engineering again um, one of the things I think that's fantastic in, in this country is that you can actually, you know, when you think big, think big, I suppose Ireland is a small country, so it's still small. It's actually really, really easy to kind of think big because everyone, there, there's, it's amazingly, in, uh, you know, uh, straightforward in terms of connecting people in this country. So one of the projects we're doing of, of the very many we do is we're building a network right across Ireland and that that network is what's known, it's, a, it's an Internet of Things network and it's focused on a specific kind of Internet of Things and we want uh, academics and companies and um, individuals and artists to use this network to create all sorts of things and to use this network as part of their imagination. And while it's very much grown out of an engineering mindset where you kind of think, okay, what will this future Internet of Things network look like and how do I build a test bed so I can prove that it can scale and that it's affordable and that it has the engineering properties I want. It's also hugely influenced by the fact, you know, this will only work if all sorts of different people come to play with this. So, so that's just kind of an example of one of the kind of projects that are part of the Connect. 
So, so Connect, as I said, is, is a fantastic um, organization uh, to be involved in and kind of fulfill that need for that kind of bigger thing. But the really interesting thing for me is that um, it has allowed the space to grow this engineering plus. And I'll get back to in a minute how, how, how that might not have happened as, you know, um, a kind of against the system rather than with the system, but nonetheless it has. So, so when I realized um, earlier on that, you know, engineering on its own wasn't enough, I started to take on PhD students um, who had kind of mixed interests. And essentially, this goes back to the point I said, I, I was in a department that actually didn't care what I did, and it really, really helped. Because there are some departments that are they're very, very interested in, in the PhD program, and they have very strict rules about who's eligible to do a PhD in, um, you know, uh, that friend of mine I mentioned in economics, they have very strict rules about you have to have such and such an undergraduate degree and you have to have such and such. A, and in my department, they didn't care. So that was actually really, really useful. And, and I, I use this, this, this slide to say, you know, what, what happened is that I began to take people who just didn't fit elsewhere. So it was really, really interesting. There wasn't kind of a strategy about, you know, there, there were people who were interested in kind of, there was one of my students, a guy called Ralph Borland, who people might know from, uh, he's given talks here before, you know, he was interested in how people designed objects um, uh, for in Africa and the kind of dominance of kind of the first world or global north, global south kind of play between the two of those. There were people actually who were interested in interactive installations and embodiment. Um, and there were people who were interested in things like how we talk to each other across different disciplines and how we communicate and what does that mean. Uh, and then there were people who were interested in kind of technologies to do with networking and their implications in art. So oh, there wasn't any particular plan, but there were a whole kind of range of different people um, who started to say, I don't really fit, um, and can I come and do a PhD? And I remember at one stage um, in the Viva, so the Viva is the bit you do at the end of the PhD where you get, get examined, one of the external examiners saying to one of my PhD students, like, what the hell are you doing a PhD here for? And um, kind of no, under couldn't think what he, and his answer actually, I was, you know, I, he just, because I don't fit anywhere else. And, and, and that's kind of how the, the whole thing started. And even now, uh, and I say even some of the other engineers I work with, if they ask me, what is it about the collection of people that do research? It's kind of very, very hard to say, other than there's a, enormous belief in the power of interdisciplinary, the power of the different viewpoint, and the fact that bringing that together will allow you uncover something, and in our case, maybe about the technology world, that you wouldn't otherwise. So, so over the years, this has now come to a point where it's kind of more organized, and we have um, uh, um, a group called Orthogonal Methods Group, and there's uh, one or two people here. Um, and and I, I'm very, very pleased that it kind of is now a thing. So it happens. It happened kind of, you know, in this kind of intuitive feeling this was needed, and now it's kind of uh, crystallized around a group of people. And um, I, I work with so many fantastic people from engineering and from the art side, uh, and I've just, I just want to mention a couple of people here, and I, I suppose I want to say I could spend all day mentioning the people, but the reason why I want to mention them is because one of the other things I feel... Um, uh, I don't know, people work in different ways, and one of the d ways that I think I can only work, I can kind of only think out loud. I, I, I need other people around. I need that kind of interaction. And, and, and essentially, um, I wonder actually, would I think, would I have a single thought if I was locked away in my own? I don't know. But, you know, people work in different modes, and that, that very much is the mode for me. So, so there have been a number of people, and I've just put three different examples here. So one of them is this woman, Jessica Foley, and... Jessica is probably one of uh, just an amazing person who brought initially to CTVR and then to Connect. So she was an artist who decided to study what it was like to be in CTVR and then Connect through arts practices um, and, and kind of understand how we communicated with each other. And she made us feel uncomfortable an awful lot of the time. And, uh, um, and she made us question ourselves a lot of the time. And, uh, and she, did, um, she runs a, a thing called Engineering Fictions, which she calls as an uncreative writing class. And um, we have a whole load of series like that. But opening up to people like Jessica, she really kind of changed the course of the group. And 
you know, while some of the engineers I work with in a day, I was joking with one of uh, uh, one of the great guys I work with, uh, Armin Above, he, he works in a thing called 5G waveforms, and I was saying, I'm not going to mention 5G waveforms, but I just put it in a sentence for you. Um, but even what I find is by through working with somebody like Jessica, that when I go to write a research proposal, I have a totally different vocabulary and a totally different way of seeing things. So it might not be that we actually use a particular topic, it's just how you see and think. And then I also have worked with uh, people like Dennis McNulty, and I, 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 he's an artist. So, we have, so Jessica is our writer in residence now. Um, Dennis is our artist in residence. Um, I'm not going to do this justice by explaining this piece that it's in the Una Young Gallery at, at the moment. I put it up there because it has, you remember the, the network I mentioned earlier, the Internet of Things network? It has a piece of that network in the installation. And that made me very happy and made me, uh, allowed us to think about it and talk about it in many ways. So he's our, our, our artist in residence. And then, uh, I, I suppose I'll just end by, by we also were really, really lucky to have, and Fiona's here actually, I just see, um, have a, a group called the Department of Ultimology. Um, so the Department of Ultimology came about through Fiona Allen and Kate Strain. This is, this is them here. I, sorry, can you? Yeah, I love this picture of them po uh, posing very well. And um, the Department of Ultimology uh, was set up because they actually got a grant themselves through the Trinity Creative Process. Um, and uh, it's about processes and ideas and concepts that die off. And I thought it would just be brilliant for a centre that was to look towards the future and understand how we would change the future to better understand also what was dying and dead and gone. And maybe that having those things coexist might help us think more and think better about what we're doing and designing. And, and one of the things as an academic, and uh, some people who are academics here might re realise this, you always kind of want to hold on to things. I'm known for something, so that's what I, I need to keep going in that direction. And I think the Department of Ultimology is about us giving up things and moving on uh, to other things. And then I'll just add one more example of a person we also now have. So, so we also, so Kate actually is our, our curator in residence, and that's what I mean about things becoming more kind of structured over, over time, which has really been brilliant. And then we also have people like uh, Deirdre Mortel, who runs Social Innovation Fund, Embedded and Connect. And I suppose I, I mention all of this because I suppose for me, um, I suppose a tenant of how, how things work is you just need to be open. And a lot of the time, I find that people turn up and I kind of think, what have they got to do with anything here and how will this fit in and what's that got to do with anything? And it has been my experience, I suppose from a network perspective, that everything is connected and that ultimately, um, you know, these links emerge and you need to have a bit of randomness and you need to have a bit of openness and you need to kind of mix it up. And I've been really, really lucky with people like I just mentioned who, you know, I, I basically met Jessica at the corner of a road after we'd both been at the same talk and then she decided to come and work with us and things like that happen. And I, and I am that kind of person who says, OK, let's try this. But I am lucky that the large organization that Connect is allows me to do that. And one of the things that I find very difficult, and I, is there's a huge amount of work to do, is that I kind of really started off by smuggling these people into Connect. So there wasn't really a proper role or a proper funding stream or a proper anything, and there still isn't enough. And it's a real shame that there isn't. And um, I know there's people here who are interested in STEAM and, uh, and interdisciplinarity, and we still have no proper way of funding that at scale. So I've been lucky that they've been able to be kind of hidden around the edges and kind of uh, you know, involved in it. But the reality is there's much, 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 much more that needs to be done uh, to systematize it. And that goes from the funding, but it also even goes from the institution perspective. And, and I, I mean, I think working in Trinity is, um, is hugely privileged, and working in academia is you just get to follow ideas that you're passionate about and that you love. But there's also this big, huge institution thing that drags things down. And we have found a lot, even as people do PhDs, that you often find people saying, I don't like the shape of that PhD. I want it to look like what I'm used to. So there's this constant kind of pushing against the institution and trying to say, OK, there are different ways to do things. Um, engineering is a wonderful field, and creative arts practices 
is in the mix, makes it a better field, in my perspective. And I, I, I'll end with a couple of things. Um, we, we very recently had um, what we call a plenary, where in Connect, uh, because it's spread all around Ireland, we get together and we, we, uh, we had all the engineers and uh, computer scientists and physicists and everything together. And, and the artists did a session in that. And I, I had prepared them to, there was, a par, there was a series of parallel sessions and you could pick which one you wanted to go to. And I said to the art, Art group. Oh, look! There'll only be two or three people at that. Don't, don't, you know. But don't be upset if there are. And the majority of people actually chose to go to that session. And I thought it's really interesting. People want to talk about ideas. They want to engage more widely. And they don't want to, you know. There's great creativity everywhere. Uh, and I found that really heartwarming. And then I'll, I'll end with two last slides. Um, so the first one is: no matter what job you have, yeah, you know, people. This is a comment from my aunt. You've not had a real job since you had that one for a year in 1989. So one of the things I find permanently is that nobody ever understands what anyone in academia does. And uh, so I get this reaction, or this is the other reaction, when I bump into a next student, you're still in college. And it always, it always comes across with this tone, repeating your exam still, or something like that. So, um, so I suppose I, I'll just end on that note saying thank you very much. It's, it's a weird thing for me to be talking about this stuff. And... Uh, um, uh, thank you for listening. So. <coughs> Do you want to share it? Any questions? Yes. Yep. <laughs> Don't say that. Linda, that was absolutely wonderful. And I've got a question for you, but I want the question, I just want to share an anecdote, yeah. which I think really captures your intellectual curiosity but your wonderful ability to be disruptive in the most positive of ways. So back in 2008, I met Linda for the first time, and John Higarty, who was the then provost and a physicist, uh, was really trying to promote uh, the arts and humanities. Um, and PRTLI was in the offering, the program for research in third level institutions, where there was big money available for the development of research infrastructures. So he wanted us in the arts and humanities to do something big. So we were having this brains, you know, stormy session. I guess Linda was there. John knew he needed somebody who was going to wake us all up and set Linda along. I can't, I can't remember this. But, anyway, <laughs> but, but, but a, to cut it long story short, we were thinking big money was like 10,000 euro, 100,000 euro. And Linda says, Jane, my God, think big. Think of something that is really, really ambitious. Anyway, out of that conversation, Came the Trinity Long Room Hub. I don't know if you guys know that <laughs> building in Front Square, um, which is obviously a research mm. institute for the arts and humanities, but it was born that day out of Linda telling us to think big, be ambitious, and be disruptive in terms of the traditional narrative. So I always think of that building. Oh, I, I didn't know that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. That's very nice. Just <laughs> um, but really my question is the one where you were talking about technology being invisible and what we are doing is recreating a, a, a patriarchy mm -hmm. but we're risk doing that yeah. because it's invisible we don't even know what we're fighting against so I suppose you're very much a, a feminist you're very uh, conscious of mm -hmm. the dangers of that and I'd like you to reflect a little bit more about the hazards around technology and the world that we're creating, especially given the exhibition on an artificial intelligence. Yeah. And really, the other thing is your experience as a senior female academic at Trinity and how we have to battle with misogyny at so many levels, obviously globally, uh, yeah. but also locally. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll try to answer those quickly. Yeah, exactly, Jane. Well, thank you for those comments. I didn't I didn't actually re realize that before. Andrew, who, who I work with, who is our communications person, hates me talking about the, the overly negative side of technology. But so to me, I, I, I suppose, so as, the way I would summarize it is I talk a lot about the algorithm. So there's an algorithm operating something in your Facebook, in, in Google when you search things. And, and that algorithm follows a set of rules and, and essentially delivers an answer to you. 
And, and, and I'll give a simple example, and I, I use it a bit in smart cities. You can have a set of traffic lights, and the traffic lights can be dynamically changing rather than set in a pattern, so they can recognize that there's a big load of traffic, and that traffic, uh, uh, they can leave that, that traffic go through, or they could recognize that there's, you know, there's very little traffic, and I don't need to be on, on red when I should be on green, et cetera, et cetera. So that sounds really benign. So the other side of that is that I could set all the traffic lights in the city of Dublin to make sure that all traffic went away from salubrious areas and into poor areas because I don't want to be stuck in traffic jams where I, 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 I live. Um, now, I'm not saying... All I'm saying with this, and this is where I think there's great power and this is where the invisibility... So that's very invisible and that can kind of happen... That can happen by accident as well because somebody just decided they were optimizing it for a certain reason in a local area and it had this knock-on effect. So I suppose what I'm saying all of the time is that people, uh, and it's actually, I met uh, this lo lovely woman here in, at a thing called Girls in Tech on, on Monday night. What I was saying is that everyone needs to be technically literate. So you don't need to be a designer, you don't need to be an engineer, you don't need to, um, but you can be a historian and look at technology, you can be uh, a, 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 you know, a poet or you can engage in literature, but you have to we have to, all of us now, be more technically literate because all of the decisions, or not all of them, a huge majority of decisions that are happening in our lives are things like that, that on the face of it seem these small changes, but you can imagine that multiplied hundreds of times throughout a city, uh, and someone somewhere is setting that function, and that could be an elected representative, or it could not be. And, and it's just, I think the onus is on us to, to, to not leave that invisibility kind of happen. And I think actually the Long Room Hub has, has done some very good work in kind of behind the headline series, where they look at things that are technology or otherwise, and they see what's behind them. And that's all I'm saying here, we need to look behind them. So. I've also a great belief in technology. So, so I side beside, I just think there needs to be an awareness and an awareness and an understanding of how we want that to function. So, so they're, they're the two things. And then very briefly on, on the academic thing, I mean, I, I, most people will know the figures around Ireland and that they're very, very poor for numbers of women who are professors and, uh, you know, I, I can't remember, I think a single, single digit figures, isn't it, in, in Ireland. And it, it is, you know, I mean, I, I get sick of the kind of answer, um, well, we're just picking the best. And, and one of the things, and I do it myself, is we recognize best according to our, you know, we often recognize best according to ourselves or according to what we understand and know. Uh, but everyone says, and you, you hear it time and time again, you know, if you want a great team, you need people who are different from you. Um, and, 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 and to me, uh, there's just a lot more thinking that needs to be done on that. I could talk about that all day, so I better not. <laughs> yeah, so any, any other questions? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Done, yeah. we've met before, yeah. so, um, I, Oh, that's right, yeah. We were talking about how the creative arts and art could help return talent. Yeah, yeah. So the frustration of me at the moment would be we've got a government purely focused on sort of financial services. Yeah. About 3.5% of the UK workforce is employed, and that's 7% of the UK workforce is in creative industries. Yeah. What, what do you think in Ireland we have to gain if we could embrace creativity into various different industries? Where, where's the sweet spot? Or where's the opportunity for growth or art development? Bring more creativity into our different sectors. Yeah, so I think I think that's that's another. You, you, you like asking me really hard questions that you go, okay. that, that are, um, and I, I I don't I don't have a, a quick answer. So w one thing, uh, so there's kind of two sides to the answer for me, and, and one one side of the answer is right, is that it drives me crazy when we as Ireland start to speak as if you know we're the first person to ever think of this. And we don't, uh, so, I, so I found actually a lot of the stuff in the other voices things where we were we're looking back at, at that stuff was all like, okay, we're the first person to come up with the idea if we put creativity and things together, you know, that we, 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 we'll be better off. So there's a huge history and there's a huge learning we can draw on to do this the right way. And I think, first of all, we have to do that. I know actually the Irish Research Council, uh, sorry to point to you, Jane, again, which is ahead of, for example, are trying to develop a policy on STEAM at the moment. So that's STEM with the arts in it. So those kind of things need to happen. But people need to do it from a serious point of view of recognizing kind of a deep history and many learning points rather than starting as if no one ever heard of this before. And, 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 and I think I see some signs of that happening in, 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 in things like that, but more of that needs to happen on the policy side. I think, um, I think there are good things happening already on... Um, uh, I see a lot of the time... So in Trinity, there's a big kind of creative technologies... Um, initiative with lots of very amazing people working on that. But there's another side to me as well, is that I think 
companies need to recognise the value of artists and people from the arts humanities in those companies. So what they often tend to do is say, I'm going to get an artist to colour this in or to make this product look nice. Or, or, you know, and that's not what this is about. And, 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 and there is a huge mismatch in terms of equality and even pay and things like that in those. And that has to happen. And I think if that happened, we'd really see something and we'd do something unique and be different from everyone else in the world. Can I just ask yeah. you a little bit about funding? Mm -hmm. Because um, not too many people can... Uh, academics can raise 70 million in, in funding, and you're that person. Um, so if the Science Foundation Ireland is your main funder, do you go and boast or tell them all about your writer-in-residence, curator-in-resident, artist-in-resident? Do you tell them about that? Yeah, so um, it's a, it, it, that's a good question. So the, quick, so the, the, the honest answer is, at, in the beginning, no, because um, they, they were kind of like, you know, OK, that's not what they're used to, and now way more. And uh, it, it, unfortunately, you kind of have to package. So, so there is a big focus and a very genuine focus in Science Foundation Ireland at the moment on education and public engagement. And uh, you sometimes have to package it in that context. And for me, that is not the only context in which it exists. But increasingly, um, it, 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 I think it's penetrating. So I, was, I don't know whether people here know Jimmy Eddy, but he's a sound artist, and he did this really amazing um, soundscape for 1916 so there was a there was a very famous morse code broadcast um during uh, easter i think it was easter tuesday of the easter rising where the rebels took over a radio station and they broadcast um uh, and it was considered the first kind of broadcast of that nature normally when you were transmitting wireless signals you sent one from one to the other and this was out into the ether and it was you know the city's taken over we've declared a republic and a hundred years to the the second, uh, Jimmy did this amazing piece where they rebroadcast that and he made this incredible surround sound immersive thing um, that kind of started with this Morse code and then kind of used tones of it. Built it. Mary, we went to it actually, but not on the exact, we had it in, in Connect and I, there was quite a few people from Science Foundation Ireland there and I could see it was a very moving thing um, uh, and I, I actually have very, a very strange reaction to 1916 myself, but that aside, they, they, it was very, and I could really see that the, the people are saying, oh, I couldn't understand what you mean because we were also talking about technology and, and networks and where they were then and where they are now. And I could really see the kind of they were thinking, oh, I get what you mean a bit more. Um, so, so those kind of things are happening all the time, but but it's still um, it's still kind of under a certain heading. And I'd like it to be kind of expanded. And we have PhDs now that are kind of connect PhDs that would be in those those wider topics. <coughs> I worked as an engineer, mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what that means, <laughs> uh, in the States uh, in the 80s. And I worked in a large multinational corporation. Uh, we were all sort of sitting in our lab, writing code, coming up with uh, amazingly non-contextual algorithms. When uh, this, new, this company launched a product, that company was Apple. And uh, IBM, Digital, all the main players at the time couldn't understand how people wanted to buy Apple. So I was sent as a spy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and no better spy. <laughs> um, and basically, what I learned out there was that they had involved creative, they involved artists into the design process. They were part of the team. They were part of the engineering team. They weren't adults. They weren't token people who were just brought in to have a look at things and see if they made sense. Yeah. Actually, they were in our de the design teams. And they embedded creativity and artists from the very beginning. And the success, well, I think we don't That's, need to even think about it. That reminds but me. There's a really great example where they got it in the 80s, where Steve Jobs could see the value that, you know, thinking outside the box and bringing it right into the beginning of the design process. Not at the end, at the beginning. Reminds me of one, one last story. I was in Boston in 1987 on a J1 visa and I saw an Apple Mac in an in, in, in office. I was just a gopher in an office. And my dad was a printer in, in, in the examiner, a cork examiner, or the paper, as they'd call it. And he's dead now. But I sent a letter home that said, hi, dad, in 25 different fonts. Because I was look what this can do. And it just said, hi, dad, hi, dad, hi, dad, hi, dad, in 25 different fonts, thinking that's the end of my father's life as a printer anyway. But <laughs> that's the letter I sent. Him. So that's my Apple story. That's a good Apple story. Yeah. Um, well, we're just coming up to two o'clock, so unless there's anyone else who mm -hmm. has a, a burning question.
will close for today. And I want to say an amazing thank you to an amazing person. Thank you. Thank you.